Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to show you K public transport, um, which is um, also somewhat indirectly an outcome of the um, privacy goal. Um, and yeah, this kind of started um, shortly after last year's academy. So last year I presented uh, KDI itinerary, which is kind of the um, the privacy aware and privacy protecting variant of uh, things like TripIt or the um, the Google itinerary integration things. Um, so and what we had last year was. Um, an infrastructure to extract um, your personal booking data from, from incoming emails and add them to a timeline. And we had um, integration with, uh, or augmentation of that with static data from, from Wikidata. So we, we had locations of airports and, and that kind of stuff. And the thing that was missing last year was access to um, real-time transport data. So delays and gate changes and that kind of stuff. And I was somewhat skeptical last year if we could get that because that is usually um, data that needs to come from the operators. Um, there's, there's usually no other way to get like the life positions of trains and, and that kind of level of detail of, uh, of data you would need for, um, for example, for delay displays. Um, however, turns out I was entirely wrong. Um, after the talk last year, I got contacted by a bunch of people actually working on this um, and working on this in a free software and open data community. Um, so I got to learn a whole lot, uh, a whole new world on, uh, on things that I had no idea existed. Um, and some of the, uh, the key elements um, is the uh, GTFS uh, data format. That is, uh, uh, again, like the, um, the itinerary data, something that Google came up with and then basically mandated the public transport operators to provide data in that format uh, if they wanted to show up on Google Maps. Um, and that is a very good way to pressure them and to motivate them. So this is actually available from uh, for many operators, um, very often under uh, open data licenses uh, and in some countries apparently legally mandated to be present under open data licenses. Um, and that exists in two variants. Um, the simple one is just basically the static schedule data, so how a train is planned to go. And uh, in Basically, all countries apart from Switzerland and Japan, there is the real-time version that shows the actual state, um, which differs there. Uh, and that is a, a bit more complicated uh, um, due to the amount of data you need to process. Uh, but that goes down to actually the GPS positions of the, all the vehicles in the, in the fleet of that operator. Um, and then to use that kind of data, um, there are several free, uh, free software projects that yeah, consume that, aggregate it, and then allow you to run queries on top of that. Like how do I get from A to B, or what is the delay of that specific train? Um, and most notably, that's uh, Navizia, that's the people that contacted us, uh, and Open Trip Planner. Um, Right, so as I said, this is um, uh, basically a free software server side thing um, where you feed in all the, the GTFS data you have. Um, and then that does all the, like, the routing algorithms on um, how, how to get from A to B. And if there's a gap in between, how can you walk? And uh, do you want to take your bike to the first? step and like all those possible combinations you you know from um, from the the routing apps um, and it gives you access to the the, the the schedules both for the for lines and, and for stops and it has the uh, 
location search so as you type the name of a stop right that, that can auto complete that so basically the all the backend stuff you expect uh, behind the routing application um, and it of course considers uh, disruptions and and delays and shows that to you or ad adjusts the routing accordingly um, and uh, yeah, you could set that up on, on our own infrastructure and then just feed in all the GTFS data we find. Um, or they also have a version they host um, that we are allowed to use. Um, and they have uh, hundreds of feeds from all over the world in there. Um, so that's their coverage map. Um, you see there's a strong bias towards Europe and the US and unfortunately, uh, very little, if anything at all, in, in Asia. Uh, so that's not ideal, but um, that's a, a huge amount of data we can, uh, can already work with. Um, so how do we get to that? Um, and that's where Cape Public Transport comes in. So that's the framework that allows us to interact with that kind of data, query it, and then represent it in a way that we can yeah, integrate that in, in an application. Um, it's a simple job-based um, query API, uh, currently supporting location searches, um, uh, departures from a, or arrivals from a given station, and uh, journeys, so how do I get from A to B. Um, it's not limited to Navizia, so it supports multiple backends. Um, uh, we'll see a bit about that uh, later. Um, and it can pick the right backend based on the locations where you are traveling. Um, so to, to get the best results and to reduce the amount of data we have to send out. Um, and that also implies we need to be able to merge results we get from different backends and that is the, that's probably where most of the code in that framework is actually needed for. Um, yeah, regarding the backends, there is uh, obviously the uh, Navizia one, which is uh, uh, providing the widest coverage at the moment. Uh, then we have support for uh, three proprietary systems. Some of them are more or less documented. Um, some of them required a bit of creativity. Um, and that is... Uh, mainly necessary for some of the German operators um, to get some, some data there. Uh, what we are still missing is a backend for the Open Trip Planner system, which is, uh, has some similarities to, to Navizia, but it has a bit of more complicated interface. Um, that would be necessary to support Norway and Finland at least, so their national railway runs on top of that. Um, and yeah, the challenges resulting from supporting multiple backends is uh, the uh, merging the results and aligning different spellings or variations of the same location in a way that um, that it's the same. Um, this is the um, coverage areas that we have beyond Navizia, so that's the mainly the proprietary backends. Uh, again, you see it's uh, strongly biased towards Europe, um, and one exception in New South Wales, I think. Um, but unfortunately, still a big gap in, uh, in Asia, and America isn't even on the map. So um, there's still quite some work necessary to make that a bit more global. Um, well, Greenland is partly covered, not because we actually cover it, but because the, the simpler you make the geometry for the um, coverage areas, the, uh, the faster it is to actually make hit detection on those areas work to, to pick the right backend. So that's why it's these weird simplified shapes. And then map projection, of course, that's why it's spreading out in the north. Um, yeah, a bit more on the result aggregation. Um, there is, uh, I think the, the, the biggest problem there is 
unlike with air traffic, there is no universal identifier for locations. Um, so uh, every backend basically has their own arbitrary numbering scheme. Um, and then you have the human readable names, um, which might be in different languages, which might use abbreviations for parts like station or central station, right? that is typically abbrevi abbreviated somehow in, in the different languages. Um, so we need to try to somehow normalize all of that and, and merge it together. Um, we quite often get geo coordinates, so that's, um, that's useful, but it's unfortunately not enough. Because if you look at one of the very large central stations, they are many hundred meters in, in size. On, in that area, you can actually have multiple bus stops. So, I mean, geo coordinates help to clearly distinguish stuff that is not next to each other, but how exactly do you group this um, together in a, in a local area? Um, then another fun problem is with, um, uh, with very local providers they tend to not add their location name or city name to the name of their stops. So if you search for airport, you find stops named airport in 15 different cities. And in the context of that city, the stop name airport, of course, makes sense. But if I try to find that without having any additional information, that isn't really helpful. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, problems with the identification of a specific train or a specific bus as well. So they tend to have um, like a line name, like M5 here. Um, but sometimes they also have individual numbers for the individual trips on that line. And it's not always clear which one you get. And uh, that also, again, makes it harder to properly merge that. Um, yeah, and spelling variants and languages, uh, I, I already mentioned that. So none of that is unsolvable, but it requires a lot of feedback uh, from people using that, uh, especially initially on weird results that they are getting, right? And then, uh, because that, this is very local and locale dependent. Uh, so I need specific test cases from in this city searching for that gives me nonsense results, or it, it merges this, or it doesn't merge that. Um, and then we can incrementally improve that. Um, yeah, privacy, that's of course something we, we need to look at, um, as that's where the whole thing started. Um, this will require online access, uh, because we, we depend on real-time data, right? So there is simply no way around that. Um, there is also very limited room for, for caching the results. That might work for location searches, but not for anything else, because we want to see delays as they occur. Um, so there is actually network traffic on the outside that is observable. Um, but at least we can control what exactly we send in those requests. Uh, the proprietary apps tend to add various unique identifiers or cookies and whatnot we can strip all of that, right, and just put in what is ab the absolute minimum that is necessary. Um, and I think that's as good as it gets, right? The, the next step is just to disable that entirely if you're concerned about that network traffic. Um, there is unfortunately a few proprietary backends that don't even support transcode security. So there your requests go out entirely unencrypted. Those are off by default. Um, but if you are living in Austria, um, KDE itinerary has a specific setting to enable that, because otherwise you don't get any data. Um, so that's a trade-off you need to do. Um, and another problem we still need to solve is if you search for a location by name where we have no context on which backend to pick, it currently picks all of them. And there might be backends in there from countries that or from providers that you don't trust, right? So we want some form of manual selection 
I know I'm in Italy, so there's no point in sending it to the UK or wherever. So um, that is something we, we still need to support. Um, then another topic that isn't all that obvious. Um, since we are dealing with open data, just like with free software, um, we have to look at license compliance and attribution. Um, so the data this is based on sometimes, for example, is licensed under Creative Commons attribution license. Um, which means if we show the data, we need to properly attribute this. Um, now, since the data comes from various sources that US the application author might not, not even know, um, the framework uh, collects all that data, aggregates it together with the results, and gives you, as the application author, um, all the information you actually need to show. Um, and you can do that in the about dialog or you show it in line next to the results. Um, and then that hopefully makes it easy to comply with the, uh, the licenses and, uh, and conditions around that. Um, what else? Right, so what currently is supported is um, the absolute bare minimum on data that we needed for um, KDE itinerary. Um, but what we get from the backends is actually a lot more. Uh, the typical result size for a journey query is easily more than 100 kilobytes in, in JSON. And what we currently extract is probably less than a kilobyte of that. Um, so there's things like um, the entire GPS track of the route you're going. Um, there is tons of options on how you want to do the routing. So how fast do you walk? Do you have an e-scooter with you, or um, do you want to avoid specific terms, uh, modes of transportation and all of that kind of stuff? Um, there is a lot more in disruption information. There is um, um, a lot of accessibility information, which actually could be quite interesting to show that in, in the application or to consider that as a, as a constraint during scheduling, right? So uh, uh, during querying. Um, if, you, if you are dependent on uh, lifts or something like that, right? So it's good to know where they work and where they don't work. Um, there is information on how full the trains are probably or are expected to be. Um, there's the whole area of pricing and ticketing, um, which we haven't touched at all yet, uh, and stuff like the estimated CO2 usage on that trip uh, in case you want to optimize for that. So there's um, a huge world that, that we haven't even uh, started with yet. Um, right, and then the people around for a bit longer might vaguely remember that we had something like that in the past. Um, and yes, there is the public transport plasmoid from the um, early KD4 times. Um, that was unfortunately discontinued, and um, it wasn't. Uh, it didn't seem uh, useful to revive that instead of uh, building something new, uh, because that was initially based on. Um, uh, web scraping, because that was the only thing available at the time. So this is like more than 10 years ago, right, before smartphones. Um, nowadays, um, most of the network operators have their own apps, and that kind of forces them to have a, a much more sensible API that we then can hook onto. And GTFS was also just starting at the time, so the uh, the bit of code that existed for that was offline processing. So you basically you download the entire multi-hundred megabyte GTF file, the static one, and do lo local routing. Um, that, however, isn't really feasible on a mobile phone, uh, let alone if you want to have the real-time data, because that's a multi-megabyte per minute protobuf stream um, from which you need one tiny detail 
um, but you need to basically have the continuous stream to update the local state. So this isn't really feasible on, uh, on mobile. Um, so there's unfortunately very little that can be, or that could be reused from this, um, uh, just because the environment has changed quite a bit since then. Um, yeah, and then I have a few pictures on how this is actually integrated. Um, so this is uh, uh, taken out of the detailed screen in KDE itinerary. Um, you can see the, the um, delays show, been showing there, and you can see um, the platform changes. So um, it changed on top and it got confirmed uh, in, the, in the lower case, so it's shown in green. Um, so that was the first bit we integrated. Um, and then the more advanced stuff, um, this is the alternative connection selector. So if you missed your connection, um, you can basically look up the, the next one on that trip. Um, the red one is cancelled, so we also detect um, uh, cancellation status and, uh, and some, some notes we get from the operator. Um, and then you can save that and the itinerary timeline updates to that, uh, uh, that new trip while keeping your ticket but dropping your seat reservation. That doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and we have um, departure schedules. So if you, um, if you arrive at the airport and want to check if you have to rush to get to the train or if you still have time for a coffee, right, that can be useful. Um, I think this is mainly a, a stopgap until we have proper navigation from, say, from the hotel, uh, from getting from the airport to the hotel built into itinerary. So that's one of the, the next steps coming up. Uh, but until then, that is kind of the, um, the easiest to implement approximation. Um, and that is the, the integration as we have it in, in itinerary so far. But then uh, Nico started a new app, uh, KTrip, which is basically focused on uh, journey planning, um, which is uh, currently, I think, the second user of um, the K public transport framework, um, which I think more directly exposes what um, K public transport actually can do. Um, yeah, so. What this, um, what this hopefully showed is that there actually is um, uh, quite some useful and freely available data around public transportation available to us. Um, and we now have the infrastructure to easily get to that. Um, and yeah, depending on what we actually want to do with it, um, we now can step by step extend the data model and extend the, the query API to support that. Um, since there is so much data, um, I'm trying to do that on an as needed basis. So whenever there is a specific thing we, we want to address, usually there's the, the corresponding data available. And then, of course, there is a lot of stuff that we could do with that data beyond um, what we have done so far. Um, there's, of course, the integration with Minecraft um, as an obvious idea, right? So you can ask Minecraft for when, when does my train leave or does my train have a, um, as a delay? Um, or how do I get to the university and that kind of stuff? Um, and something I would like to see is the um, kind of the commuter counterpart to itinerary, so for your regular daily trips, um, showing you the delays or showing you alternative means to get to, do, to work or to get back home. Um, where this is, of course, also a nice uh, building block for. Um, and I mean, bigger picture, all of this is basically building blocks for um, um, a larger digital assistance system that we hopefully one day will have on, uh, on Plasma Mobile. Yeah, and that's it. That was amazingly on time, just like public transport ought to be.
Questions? Um, some providers, like in the Netherlands, they do have fairly extensive, albeit proprietary, APIs, but they are gated behind API tokens. How do you deal with that, or at all? Um, we have that problem already. Some of the backends we use um, uh, require API tokens. Um, they are checked into the source code. That seems to be the standard everybody is doing it. I was very reluctant to do that, and I talked to some of those people, and they said everybody else is just publicly checking in those as well, so that's what we do. I mean, for most of them, you get the API tokens for free, so there is very little incentive in stealing them, right? I mean, you need to sign up for them, but they are essentially free, so... They, they are sometimes rate limited, but those that I've seen have rate limits that are way above being a problematic anyway. And for Navizia, we talk to them and they actually, um, they give free software very favorably, rate, non-rate limited or, but, well, API tokens with very high uh, rate limits, so that's not a problem. Uh, for those sources which either don't have an API or have an API that we cannot use for whatever reason, is web, web scrapping an option? I, I saw you mention web scrapping. I don't know if... Yeah, I mean, in, in theory, you could implement um, a backend that works via web scraping. Um, I'm just a bit too lazy to do that, but if, it, it might indeed be that there is providers where we have absolutely no other option. Um, and yeah, I mean the backend API is uh, basically just give me the results how to get from A to B or something like that, right? And how you do that is up to the backend. So web scraping would be would be ugly, but it would be an, um, a technical option here. Do you think you need uh, an infrastructure, some server, in order to provide the answer that a mobile phone will require? Um, yeah, I mean, this, this needs server infrastructure, but luckily not our server infrastructure. So we use the server infrastructure from Navizia and from the uh, commercial backends. So um, in theory, we could host the Navizia software ourselves and maintain all the data in there ourselves. But that would, there would be very little gain to that, apart from a lot of work. So better share that, right? If you do that, are you not sharing the information, your personal information with Navizia? Um, well, you, of course, they see the same, they see the queries you sent there, yes. So um, they see that somebody is querying how to get from A to B. Um, but there is no identifying token beyond the IP address that would connect us to you specifically, right? Um, it's connected to, this is coming from the KDE library due to the API tokens. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we would host that ourselves, you would still share this with KDE. Um, maybe you trust KDE more than you trust the other guys, um, but essentially you're still sharing this, right? Um, Self-hosting that for each individual person, I don't think that scales. Because the, um, the GTFS real-time protocol is quite heavy. That might produce multiple megabytes per minute updates. So if suddenly many thousand people draw the data from those backends, I think we'd cause a problem there, right? So this stuff is designed to be used with very, very few servers that consume it and then share it. Um, I mean, yeah, th there is a trade-off we need to do in, in regard to privacy uh, because it, it isn't doable without online access. So. Anyone else? Otherwise, let us thank Volker and be on time. Thank you.